Hello guys and welcome back to the Motor Recon Podcast. I'm your host Adam. I'm joined again today by Rob. Um, what we're going to do today is, because we've just seen it in the news um, literally yesterday, um, we saw it teased back in January 2018, but Ford have just announced that they'll be unveiling their all new Mustang inspired SUV next month on yes. the 11th of November. Now, this is something that we're both quite interested in. Um, mainly because we see this as a major headache for a car that we both actually quite like, which is the Jaguar I-Pace. Yeah. Now, obviously, we haven't seen this car in the flesh yet, but they have released sort of a, I don't know what you call a it, a silhouette. silhouette. I think a yeah, silhouette, like a yeah. silhouette of the car that's upcoming. And if that shape is how that car is going to look... Jaguar have a lot to worry about. Well, as you say, I genu- I know the looks can be quite divisive on the Jaguar I-Pace. I think from the front, everyone can agree for an SUV, it looks quite good. But yeah. I think from the back, things start getting a little bit, are you into it or are you not? Yeah. I happen to be into yeah, it, I, actually. I don't mind it either. Yeah. And because, obviously, with these electric cars, they don't have a front engine, they can bring that nose down, which normally on an SUV is quite high, which gives it that more sporty look, I feel. Well, I would say, looking at the silhouette of this new all-electric SUV, I think the back end is going to be very pretty. Very, yeah. So they have also done that, well, it's, it's not a silhouette as such, it's kind of like a bit of a rendering on mm. the official Ford website as well, so it will be accurate. Of the rear end, and it does have definitely have the Mustang rear lights, yeah, which is great. The side the side profile is very Mustang esque in terms of the rear arches and sort of the humps over the rear wheel. Obviously, the way that it shapes down over the nose and the Mustang headlamps as well, by the looks of it, yeah, so definitely. It looks like it's got quite a few of those. Now, obviously, we don't know what this is going to be called, but given the fact that they are pushing that this is Mustang inspired, they're even putting the horse on there in electric blue mm. and all that kind of thing. We're, we're suspecting it's going to be some reference to a Mustang. Well, as you say, we've read somewhere as well that it's going to be called the Mark E, obviously harking back to the Mark 1. So yeah. I-, I would hazard a guess that there is going to be Mustang branding on there, which gives it that competitiveness to the I-Pace because both of those have not necessarily racing pedigree, but they have sports car pedigree together, don't they? Yeah, and it's also as well, obviously Ford used to own Jaguar. Mm. So they have worked closely together before, and now it's funny that they're sort of bringing this out, which could be a very, very arch rival Yes, very much to so. Their, to their old sort of ally. Reading the bump, one of the things where the um, new Ford EV will have the I-Pace licked is on range. Yes. Um, so, as you say, it has up to 370 miles on a single charge, which, if that happens to work out as relatively accurate, is a really impressive output. Yeah. Now, again, we don't know any prices for these generally electric cars can be quite expensive and if they are pushing the Mustang name with it as well I'm hoping it's going to be starting around 35 40,000 I'm hoping for a range between 40 to 50,000 pounds which if that happens to be true would probably undercut the eye pace yeah by a little bit and may attract some of those potential customers that feel like the eye pace is commanding a little bit too yeah. much for what it is now this this is where I think Ford will have the upper edge here because Ford have something that Jaguar don't which is money mm. um they're investing heavily in electric cars they've got an 11 billion dollar program going on and they're gonna well on their thing it says they're gonna do 11 all electric cars by 2022 so that's a fair rate of pace to be pushing these out and i think that will bring a lot of new customers to the brand as well and also existing customers like ourselves i'd be very interested if they sort of trickled this down into the smaller models yes i I hate to sound like a broken record but with all that money being plowed into electric technology by ford it would make sense to me for them to stick their hat into the ring and get muscling in on Formula E. Yeah. Jaguar have done it, and now so many manufacturers are in the ring. I think, especially if they're looking to go down this route of uh, promoting their electric cars with their sporting brand, why don't you give it some sporting pedigree by having Ford competing in the big leagues of electric yeah. racing? And obviously Ford as well do have a very good racing They do past, indeed, yeah. Like... Jaguar do as well, and most other brands do that. Obviously, like the Mon winners, they do a lot of stuff in America with NASCAR and uh, all those sort of brands and touring cars over here as well. I, I genuinely do believe Ford would do very well in there. Actually, I think it shares a lot of their ethos. It's a, it's a get up and go kind of sport. It's more about how hard you push into it. It's less money orientated than F1, so the potential to lose 
a lot is much lower as well. It also, again, it gets, you, gets your name out there a bit more. Not that they need it. Everybody knows what Ford is. No, but I think but, it gets them out there as a specific competitor for electric vehicles, which I think is something that brands need. It's all well and good being known as a manufacturer of internal combustion engines, but I suppose you will have that edge in the electric world if you can also promote your car as, yes, it's just another EV. And as the car reviewers often say, a lot of EVs drive broadly the same. Yeah. gives you that marketing edge by going, well, it also comes off the back of Formula E technology. Yeah, which I'll, I guess in the future will become more and more of a selling point for yeah. these guys. And because obviously younger generations who grow up with Formula E as normality mm. rather than Formula 1 they'll see that as a good thing. Yes. So another thing as well that Ford actually have done off the back of this, now it's quite good they've done this. So most people, as we've discussed before, with electric cars, their sort of problem is range anxiety. Yeah, That's I would put say it in so. the best way. Now, obviously it does claim a 370 mile range, which is a lot for a, a, a sort of an electric car. It's in, it's in the realms of Tesla's. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very much in the It's realm. very it's much very, there, very much yeah. It's a very good Tesla. performance figure, yeah. So what Ford have done on their own website, um, they give you sort of a trip so you can plan your trip. So you can imagine, you, I don't know, you're going on holiday or you're just concerned about going to and from work if you have a long commute um, and you can put punch in the two postcodes or zip codes if you're in America of where you, between two destinations and it shows you every charging point along the way. Mm. Now, I don't think it specifically specifies the type of charging points these are, so I imagine it's a little bit hit and miss of it, because I, I certainly wouldn't go in there assuming they're all rapid charging points. No. I mean, I don't know whether they are or aren't, because it doesn't really clearly specify the difference between them all, but the point is, as far as the UK is concerned, it looks like that there is a fairly decent spread of them. For this test, we decided to do a route from... Um, uh, Land's End in Cornwall, which is, if you aren't from the UK, the most southerly part of the United yeah, Kingdom. Yeah, very much in the south Very much in the south. And then straight up to John O'Groats, which is the most northerly point in yes. Scotland, um, which is before you can go out into the... Is it, what isles are this? this guy oh, yeah, you can, go, you can go out, obviously, from there. So what the Ford Route Planner does is it shows you exactly where you should think about stopping. Mm. So if you set off from... Land's End, it's telling you to stop and give it a full charge at Crewe, mm. which is just south of Manchester, really. It's actually where they make Bentley, interestingly enough. But um, it's telling you to pull off there and have yourself a rest. After after that length of time, you'd be tired anyway. So if you really could make it to Crewe on, a sing on that charge and it's telling you to pull there, that is brilliant. Oh, yeah. That is brilliant. So yeah. Now, obviously, this is all theoretical. It's, all, again, how, you, how the individual driver drives yes so obviously you, you, you see they're flooring it everywhere in the small print it obviously states that the range that they're using is based on the wltp yeah. sort of cycle and things like that so that they're, they're being more than upfront by saying that obviously this is highly dependent on real world variables and how you drive and all yeah. of those sort of things so what so obviously i think realistically i reckon you'd probably be looking at 350 between 320 and 350 miles and again you but that's the thing anything north of 300 in the real world is very impressive yeah it'll comfortably get us to london well even the eye pace which i happen to quite like but that has a range of around 250 to 260 miles yeah so even if you were driving that exactly to the wltp cycle specifications you ain't getting north of 300 no so yeah, it, and, and that could be, the, again, another selling point. And with it being Ford, a much bigger company, they can probably afford to absorb some more of the cost and sell it cheaper. Well, we discussed in, obviously, an earlier podcast about the fact that the things customers care about with electric cars are slightly different to those of internal combustion. And one of those key selling points is to do with range. Yeah. So I feel that, again, range will play a big part into which electric car you choose because it comes down to how far can I get on one charge. Yeah. And this sort of stuff got us thinking. Obviously, Ford are sort of pushing down the Mustang route, which is an iconic name. Obviously, they're putting it on an SUV, but they're going into the modern technology within that. Mm. So it got us thinking, what other cars that are currently available do we sort of want to see this technology coming into in their next generation of car? Um, so I'll let you start with your first one that you've selected, uh, and then we'll go on to a few of the others. Yeah. So a current car that's available now, and in their next generation, what do you want to see this technology in? 
So a car that's been around for a long time now that I feel is getting a bit long in the tooth is the Jaguar F. So the Jaguar F Type. Yeah, very much so. Don't get me wrong, I love it. I loved it when it came out. That's grand, but it's getting old. It needs its new refresh, and apparently that is coming very soon. Yeah, very very soon, I think. So um, we've decided to use the two liter turbo as the base model to discuss the current specifications because that's the most efficient one they currently sell. But given that Jaguar is in Formula E, not only that, they're a race winning Formula E team now as well. Obviously, they won one in the previous season. And with the I-Pace utilising Formula E technology, I feel that the next F-Type should have an electric variant that utilises that FE technology. Okay. that Yeah, that makes sense. I know they've currently got it in the I-Pace, like, um, like we have mentioned in the past. So... A lot of reviewers and journalists who have actually driven that do comment on how well it handles, particularly obviously for an SUV, which isn't saying much, but they do say it handles very sporty. And for an electric car as well, because obviously their characteristics are wildly different to those of internal combustion engines. And getting that feeling of excitement and sporting dynamics, I imagine, is very different and more difficult in an electric car. Yeah. Now, what I think is, obviously, with the I-Pace, it's a tall car, it is an SUV, so it's probably quite easy to put all the batteries in the floor because you're in the raised-up driving position anyway. It'd be very interesting to see how they would incorporate all that into a two-seater sports car and keep that driving position quite low to the ground well they don't have to do any of the trunking for the um sort of drive shaft through to the rear wheels and things like that yeah so they can, or the, or they the can. gearbox for example yeah. or anything that goes you know potentially to the back so there are ways that they can do it i guess i wonder if there's because you know formula e cars do have tech i know it's not actually a gearbox but they do have sort of different speeds yeah in a sense it'd be quite cool to see that in one of the road cars as well because it might use less power in a higher speed perhaps yeah, like more, it, like as you say, bike. Formula E cars do tend to have a couple of gears well some of them do that it varies from team to team it's one of those things that they can actually amend I believe Yeah. so it will be interesting to see that technology brought into a road car and I think that yeah. That could be a good platform for them to do it on, though. Well, I just think as well, because the F the F type is Jaguar's sports car sort of model, it would make sense to try and bring their motor racing pedigree into that model. But I'd be curious to see how they'd manage it. Okay. Well, another one that we were just looking at. Now, this isn't... So, the Mazda MX-5, I know we've touched on it quite a few times, but Mazda, with the new Mazda 2... Uh, have launched something called Sky Active X, mm. um, which is a new engine uh, from Mazda, which is petrol, but it works like a diesel. Now, I'll let Rob explain this in a bit more, because he's a bit more technical than I am in this kind of field. So, can you just explain re really briefly how this new Sky Active technology works? Well, I would say the best place to go for information on this is Mazda themselves. They've put out a fantastic little page which briefly summarises the yeah. way that their technology works. Essentially, they have painted in some technology called Spark Controlled Compression Ignition. Catchy. Yeah, a catchy, catchy title. But what it does mean, and as they explain very clearly on their website, is that... It means that they compress the air and fuel mix to an extremely high pressure, like a diesel engine. So they have a spark still though, and it ignites a very small dense amount of fuel. And then obviously there's pressure that does the rest. And it says that obviously the high pressure causes the remaining fuel to ignite like a diesel. And they say the upshot of all of this technology is that fuel burns more quickly and more completely and you get better performance, but you also get fewer emissions than a conventional petrol engine as well. Yeah. So this we were discussing, we think is the last bastion of maybe the naturally aspirated sports cars, because it doesn't have a turbo on the engine at all. No, it does not. And, and uh, Rob was mentioning that the perfect car for this type of engine is the MX-5. Yeah, exactly, because that car typically doesn't have a turbo. Obviously, no. you can buy aftermarket turbocharging equipment, but from factory quite often... It's a naturally aspirated, manual little sports car. And I genuinely do believe that if you stick one of these in there, because we were reading at the top, the one that they were specifically referencing, I don't know whether it's the Mazda 2 or the Mazda 3 that it comes from, but this engine can return 52.3 mpg combined, but it also produces 180 brake horsepower. Yeah. Now, one thing I will just slightly compare it to... Um, because I've only had experience with this, but it was a turbo engine, was the 1.6 litre in the ST. Mm. Now, that was, again, 180 horsepower. 
similar to this. Yeah. I could comfortably do 52 MPG. Okay. But it was turbocharged, and the turbo obviously does reduce emissions on it slightly because it's obviously recycling the spinning air. Yeah. So while I do, I really appreciate the fact that they've done this, and I actually commend them because it's not turbocharged. So I think that's where the technology's moved on the engine I can compare it to is that engine. And it was great, full of torque, very much lower, lower down torque as well. But this, even more so, being like a diesel, that I think that'll accelerate like a gnat. I'm curious to see what the characteristics of it are driving like. Will it be like a traditional naturally aspirated engine, or will it behave more like a d? Di- so, or will it behave more like a diesel? So, sort of, because of the high pressure, I'm assuming that it has to run to lower revs, much like a diesel engine. So, I'm curious to see how all of this would work. If I could ever get the opportunity to get my hands on one to see what it's like to drive, well, I'm I'd sure, love to. I'm sure we can try and sort that out. With, yeah, with a dealer. Um, no, I'd be very curious to see what that's like, and I'd be very curious to see whether it could find a home in the MX-5 as well, yeah. as a potential future, again, because this may well be the last holdout of the naturally aspirated internal combustion engine. Yeah, before, so, the, before it even goes to hybrid or fully electric. Which... Well, I, just, just even without the hybrid technology, just having an internal combustion engine that isn't force-fed by a turbocharger. Yeah, which so many are. Which, I, well, pretty much everybody's going down that route now, so... Yeah. And unless someone else comes up with another way of doing that that's not affecting their patent... Yeah, well, as you say, I did notice, obviously, they they state off in front that this is patent and technology, so... Yeah, unless they sell it, you never know. Uh, True, yeah. But it it can happen. Yeah. So another one that um, Rob just did bring up as well, sort of the... This is very much a British mark, Morgan. Now, they make the car called the Plus 6, as many of you, I'm sure, are very well aware. Um, powered by a BMW engine, has a BMW gearbox and drivetrain, all all those gubbins. Now, you were saying as well that you might like to see a manual in this car, because at the moment it's still an automatic, which is unusual for a Morgan. As you say, it's the perfect platform to mate it to a manual with as well. If that manual comes from BMW, fine by me. Uh, it yeah. doesn't bother me in the slightest where that manual comes from. So if Morgan feel like it's a better alternative to outsource it back to the BMW to get that manual made by all means do so well i suspect they might anyway well if they are going to do it they would anyway because the it's the same engine that's in the m140 now that has a manual option available perfect so there already is a gearbox that does perfect. work with that engine no that sounds fantastic and i'd love to see it in in the plus six as well to be honest, i was actually a bit surprised that they went with the automatic for this one because morgan if you have heard of them, you'll know that they are very old-fashioned in the sense that the cars haven't really changed design since whenever 1940 or something. And they've also done very things like making things out of wood. I know they're moving on a bit now. There's still sections made out of wood. Mm. And keeping that sort of analogue driving experience alive, I thought would be very important to them. Well, honestly, um, we were at Goodwood, obviously, earlier this year, and that was the first chance I got to see the Plus 6 up and close. Yeah. And I absolutely loved it. As yeah, in, it, lo- I, it looks fantastic. I mean, is it? and I'm sure the automatic box that it comes with works a treat as well, and I'm not disputing any of that, but I do feel a manual option would be nice because if it was me and my money and I was going out to buy that Morgan... Especially when it shares the same engine as the Z4, as an example. Yeah. It's a question of, I'm buying the Morgan because I don't want what the Z4 offers. As nice as the Z4 is, obviously it has all of the modern trimmings that are fantastic, but I'm buying the Morgan because I want a back-to-basics almost. Yeah. It's almost like a time warp, isn't it, in a, it lot, of, in a lot of ways. So in that time warp, I'd want my manual. Yeah, and I know obviously they are ha- they're having to go down this route, and I think in the future, obviously, they've already done an electric model, but all these are eventually going to become electric. And I unfortunately do think it might slow the sales of these down, because most of them, let's be honest, are bought by um, older gentlemen. No, it's potentially people just looking for a bit of history. They without are. the problems of history so they don't it's like you want a classic car but you don't want the classic car problems i suppose like they like they obviously do e-type so electric it's like converters. eagle yeah as well no i feel that this off the morgan obviously i feel like it's an affordable way to get the thrills that people like eagle and singer offer yeah. now i know that sounds like wild and it doesn't make sense but bear with me a second no, I because get a plus six in a lot of ways is like a classic car 
Yeah, look, especially looks, looks wise. wise and with some of the technology that it uses and the fact that the Morgan design hasn't changed really that much since its conception, I feel that is a great way to get your eagle or singer thrills on a lower budget. I mean, what are these? Do they start at under 100 grand? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. And this is just probably my own preference. I think that would be more fun to drive. But just purely on the basis it's so light and such an open car. I reckon it'll handle better. I don't think it looks better, but I think it'll handle better and I think it'll be a lot more fun to drive. It's interesting. I've read a few reviews on this now that people genuinely do like this Plus 6. And they say not only does it have the classic stylings of Morgan, but it's probably one of the most capable Morgans that has ever been produced. Yeah, and well, it's because it's, it's got the BMW parts in it. Hasn't well, it? they've made a step forwards in technology as well. Obviously, yeah. they've got a new des- they've got a new platform that they're building it on as well. Though it still has that wonderful craftsmanship and woodwork, it is a step forward still. Well, another traditional brand, sort of from the British um, Isles, is Lotus. Mm. Now, obviously, they have brought out. The, is it the Havar? I can't pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, the Havar. 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 Yeah. Now that obviously going to be the fastest car ever made allegedly with the most powerful electric motors and all that kind of thing so they are looking at the future and they are doing the right thing Mm. so how do you think they're going to trickle down that technology into the smaller uh, ones sort of like the evora the exige the elise things like that because it's gonna have to happen now my point of this was because they already use toyota engines do you think they might go down the Toyota hybrid route initially, or do you think they'll just go straight to their well, own? It's interesting because when I think of Lotus and I think of their biggest competition, there is only one mark I feel Lotus has to square up against, and that's Porsche. Okay, yeah. And I feel like it's Porsche because people who are looking at an Evora are probably looking at a Cayman. Yeah, or a Boxster. Pe- or yeah, people like who that. are looking at a Lease might be looking at a Boxster. The point is. Yeah. It's your hard-earned money, and I feel they would jump straight to electric. I feel they have an op- it's potential for them to jump to electric, while other bigger brands that sell a lot more cars might still be interested in going for the internal combustion routes, maybe, you know, downsizing capacity. I feel that this might well be an opportunity for Lotus to steal a charge. Well, the original Tesla Roadster was based off an Elise. Okay, that's cool. So it is possible... To yeah. make it happen, yeah. obviously anything's possible if you get the right engineers in there. But obviously, how long ago was that now? Ten plus years, something it, like that. It's a not while more. back, yeah. and that was based on the Elise in some respects. Obviously, just electric powered. Yeah, it had its it had its problems, like all new. So sort of, at that point, it was a brand brand new manufacturer. And yeah, we were just pushing it out there. So it is doable, and like you say, I think this now with all this new technology that they've got coming in with the Havar, Havar is just the perfect chance to jump at this and try it out even if they keep a petrol model of the equivalent there do a petrol evora but also do an electric evora i would put more weight behind this is the thing i agree maybe have your petrol model there and ready to go but i think that if you push more emphasis onto the sorry if you put you have your petrol model but you should put more emphasis on the electric one. Oh no of course that's the thing just have the petrol model for those who aren't convinced by it yet i feel like this is your opportunity to really as you say take a charge if you don't have the financial backing obviously that porsche do you do potentially have that flexibility because there isn't so much to lose either is yeah. there let's be honest in that respect so. well Lotus now have obviously got the money behind them because they've been bought by is it Geely they've bought them it's, it's a Chinese firm yeah. Right? yeah now I think it is. they have a lot of money and I think they are going to start pumping this in it's obviously evident with the development in the electric motors they're doing I really really commend them to do this jump on it bite the bullet and go for it and see what you can come up with because they're renowned for being the very good handling and no one has done a really, really lightweight, superbly handle handling electric car. Yeah. That's the I'm well aware, and obviously with the limitations of current technology, I'm more than willing to accept that it's gonna be heavier than your traditional Lotus. Got it. That's yeah. fine. I appreciate that. The technology is limited. But then that means how light can you make it? Yeah. Strip it out, as in Go do what Colin Chapman loved to do. Yeah. Make whatever the limitations you have and make it as light as you can. Yeah, and see what can come and of it. And see what can come of it, exactly. Yeah. Now, I, I 
I hope they do. And honestly, I think or to, in obviously in order to survive, they're gonna. And they're looking at the right steps. So I have faith in them. And yeah, me come, too. I genuinely through, do believe they've come through, they've come through worse. Yeah, they've come through a lot worse. Yeah. So just quickly off on a tangent as well, because we were discussing this off uh, off the mic, and we were looking at sort of we we're discussing the, a couple of brands that generally have a bad reputation or most people don't generally like but we are now starting to like them more yeah i think this is something that obviously we're warming to them and traditionally in the uk at least anyways these aren't brands that people particularly it's not what well, car people yeah they've got a yeah, bit of car stigma. people and yeah. and, bit, and i might add both of these have got stigma thanks to old school top gear yeah, let's be and, honest. And other reasons why genuinely the older products did have issues. Yeah, well, that's no a, well, one can deny that. Well, I'd say it's interesting because well, the first one we're going to talk about is Peugeot. Yeah, and it's interesting because Peugeot have gone through a phase of everyone used to love them, and I love some of their classic models. Yeah, the two or five GTI. Two or five GTI like is like a yeah. legend, yeah. no doubt about it. And their WRC pedigree is legendary. Obviously, their Group B. Yeah, and Dakar. Output, and, and Dakar, Dakar as well. Yeah. But then there was this, there was this middle trough of just the noughties, really, yeah. wasn't it? It was the noughties that really did it. Yeah, everything they made was utter tripe. It didn't look nice. No. The interior was awful. Uh, I was unfortunate to drive a couple of them, and they, they are shambolic pieces of engineering. Yeah. And um, someone, uh, someone from work actually as well, they had a relatively new one. It was the last generation of two white plus brand brand new ones just come out. And the clutch would go every few months. God, that's terrible. And that never drove it ridiculously, like racing everyone, grinding gears or anything. But the clutch would go every couple of months until the point where she finally got it through like an ombudsman complaint to get the a brand new car, mm. which it was a long thing to go through. But So they have had problems. But one area they have really, really come on in this next generation is design. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Love wow, the design. their new cars look good. We were, dri- we were, actually, we were, we were driving home... Um, uh, just coming along from Manchester yesterday in convoy, um, and a five double o- five oh eight is it? The yeah, five oh eight. Yeah, I, thought I saw it coming in the mirror. I'm like, what is that? And it just the angled front lights, like the DRLs on there. It looks old school in yeah. a lot of ways, in a good way. Extremely in, yeah. good looking car. Very nice. And the new two oh eight, fantastic looking car. And by all rev- and by all accounts as well, the interior mm. is. Very well appointed and extremely well made. Yeah, and as well as we discussed last week, Peugeot have somehow managed to come out on top of the reliability study. They did indeed. So they're now, yeah, they're now technically classed as the most reliable car in the UK. I feel like they have very much turned a corner. Yeah, and credit to them. Yeah, absolutely. They've obviously seen that there was a problem, and it had, to be fair, it, ever, it is since the Top Gear yeah. thing. They've rapidly turned the corner, and it looks like they're pumping a lot of money into their design and engineering, and it is paying off. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I won't comment on how they drive because I haven't driven any of the new ones as yet. But I'll uh, tell you something, though. For the first time in a long time, I want to go and find out. Yeah, and as particularly as well, <laughs> obviously, they bring out the electric version of it, but we've discussed that in the past. Um, it's interesting they are going down that route and they're pumping money into it as well. So they're looking at the future now, which is, is good. So I think they've done a great job with that and they carry on Peugeot you turn yourself around and you bring back some of them cars it gives that me, everyone loved yeah it gives me deep hope for the new Peugeot 208 GTI yeah let's make this a two horse race between the Fiesta ST and the 208 GTI because yeah. let's face it it used to be it used to have the Vauxhall Corsa VXR that's long gone that, well, that also, can't even that's, no one even could compete it against the Fiesta ST it just lost in every single aspect so Peugeot that's your challenge make the next generation of this on par at yeah, least, as you say, make tr- it, try and make it better. But if you can't make it better, make it as good. Because if the two hundred eight GTI, the next one, was genuinely brilliant, I would genuinely be interested in buying it. Get yourself a cool old school rally sort of paint job. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. Yeah, and I think it's great. Another one as well, but this is interestingly enough because they have actually been bought by Peugeot. Yeah, or PSA. So this is actually Vauxhall. Now. I can comment on the way these drive because I had the brand new Astra last weekend um, from a, it was a work car, but I had it for the weekend and a few days during the week, and it is abysmal to drive. Yeah. However, styling-wise, looks great. Okay. Insignia. 
I think it looks great. Oh, the insignia looks fantastic from the outside. I'm not genuinely, and again, maybe a controversial opinion here, but I prefer it to the Mondeo. Well, the Mondeo's obviously being killed now. As in it's quite, looks it's quite wise, old, yeah, yeah, but looks wise, yeah. I feel like... But yeah, looks wise, hands down, I'll agree with you. Looks miles better. To drive, I'm pretty sure it won't be as good. No. Going off the Astra, because I know they share a few engines and they share the gearbox and things like that. So if it is anything like the Astra, God help it. Which is probably why you don't see too many of them knocking around if people test drive them and don't like it. Um, but again, the new Corsa coming out and the Corsa E, it is a copy and paste job of the Peugeot, but that means it looks fantastic. Okay, well, if it was your money then... And say, for example, the new Corsa, whatever the hot one might end up being. It'll be a VXR. It drives well, let's say, like the Peugeot 208 GTI drives well. Take the Fiesta out of the equation. Yeah. Which one would your money go on? Hmm. If they give them independence and, and what they do, and like engineering di uh, independence, Peugeot. Yeah, well, I would say, say for example, if they both drove identical to each other, they shared pretty much the same platform, it's just the styling and badge difference. Peugeot. Peugeot, me too. Because I like It's got the, more I of like heritage the, as well. I like the rallying yeah, history. It's yeah. got more of the heritage to it. Now, obviously, it's, it is like the Subaru BRZ and the Toyota 86. It's technically the same car, but realistically, you want the Subaru. Yeah, you do, yeah. It's, it's just, just a cooler things, brand, yeah. isn't it? Now, obviously, Peugeot and Vauxhall, none of them have what you'd consider a good badge. People like people aren't going to be rushing out and go. Oh, I want the new. I want a Peugeot. No, it's no one's bucket list. No, is it? but out of the two, I would pick the Peugeot mainly as well because it's the parent company as well. Yeah, it's true. Get it from source type. Yeah, thing. get it from source type thing rather than just some rebadged version of the same thing. But yeah, I would do that. And I think credit where it's due. They are taking a U-turn and they are bringing the brands back. Mm -hmm. Just if the Peugeots drive anything like the Vauxhalls do. It's not going to be good. But I, don't know, but I don't think it will. I think we're optimistic, though. Yeah, I'm optimistic. I think we're optimistic. Very, very optimistic. Yes. Credit where it's due. Crack on with it, guys, and, and let's see some good cars. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a good place to wrap it up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we'll come back again, obviously, next week for another episode. Uh, so we'll see you again then. And again, as always, all the links to social media and everything in the comments. Mm -hmm. So submit any questions you want or topics you want us to discuss. And we'll go from there. Yeah. All no right, problems. guys. Cheers. Yeah. See you later.